their specifications. There are a number of them out there. Uh, however, for this lesson, I'm going to focus on three specification types. One, REST APIs, GraphQL APIs, and GRPC. Now, I have explained in previous lessons design principles, <clears throat> but I think it is really important to sort of adhere to when, obviously, when you're designing new APIs, you adhere to those design principles, but then with each specification type, they have their own unique strengths and they have their own unique weaknesses. Now, to further bring that home, I would like to discuss these terms. By definition, with REST APIs, it is simply the most commonly used architectural styles for APIs, especially for web applications. It leverages standard HTTP protocol and follows a resource-oriented approach where each resource is represented by a unique URL. However, for GraphQL, it is a query language for APIs that provides a more flexible and efficient approach to data fetching. Unlike REST, where each endpoint returns a fixed data structure, GraphQL allows clients to specify exactly what data they need in a single request. It's also different with gRPC because gRPC is a high performance open source RPC and RPC simply means a report procedure call framework that uses something called protobufs, which is a protocol buffer for data serialization. And it was simply developed by Google and it is well suited for microservices and high performance use cases. Before we go into the different key concepts, I'd like to explain something here. GraphQL was built by Meta for the sole purpose of search. gRPC was also developed by Google for their own use cases, similar to YouTube, how you can use YouTube in, because it's a high performance um, use case where you have various videos, endless videos that are being played. And so they needed something or a framework that sort of supports this. And this is why gRPC is not as popular in mainstay. REST is the most popular because REST simply does the basic things that you need. When we talk about search a lot, you can start to speak about GraphQL when you talk about pointed search. That is, things like social media search, things like e-commerce website search, things like video streaming website search or web page search, things of that nature. That's where you start to think about GraphQL. And so with these examples in mind, I'd like to take you through the following key concepts for REST, GraphQL, and gRPC. For REST, you have the following key concepts around resource, resource it being resource-oriented, it being stateless, having a uniform interface, it is catchable, and it has a client-server architecture that is a client, it must always have a client and a server, right? The client and server are basically separate entities that they communicate using HTTP, right? The server is responsible for processing requests and returning appropriate responses. And the client is responsible for creating those requests, really. So that pretty much explains the key concepts within REST. Now, I did promised that I was going to talk a bit more about how REST and OpenAPI are very interlinked. And I'll give this example. We have OpenAPI specification 3.12 or 3.2 as of the time of doing this lesson. So I believe that um, that's where we are currently. And the reason why we got there was simply a, a couple of reasons, right? We wanted to standardize or the, in the API world, really, we wanted to standardize how we communicate, right? And OpenAPI, the simple concept is we are using REST 
concepts, really. It's, it is more so like a REST API. But what we have just simply done is we have just added a few more things on top of it, right? So you have things like you have introduced, it, it can be written in YAML or JSON. Most times you see it written in YAML. And YAML is simply a superset of JSON, really. Um, and so it's not really dissimilar, really. Um, and when you look at an open API, API, you would, you would pretty much think it is an REST API. And that's because it is, because it's using resource oriented. You see get, put, post, all of that. You see all of that in there. But the difference is that you see it is, it is well documented in a way or in a fashion that sort of helps um, this, right? Um, and I think like it has been successful so far, right? Um, and I would say this much, right, about OpenAPI. Because it was a group of people or a group of companies, right, that decided to put this together, right, the success of OpenAPI has sort of been organic, pretty much. It has been organic, pretty much. Um, and I would say, like, it actually really started with people actually deciding that, you know what, we're going to come together and we're going to actually just create this format, right, that is simply readable for the user, right? And so I wanted to sort of describe a few things in here. And so I decided that I was going to, like, make a few notes. Number one. Course, core concepts for open, a, for open API is that it's basically um, a specific format for describing RESTful APIs, right, in a machine readable way. Yeah, it usually uses YAML and JSON, like I did ex, um, explain earlier on. It describes endpoints, it describes methods, parameters, headers, auth authentication, requests, and response schemas. It is used to document, number one, test, mock, generate REST APIs, really. And it supports API-first development and contract testing. It's not too dissimilar from REST because it's really just taking REST and just adding, basically, if it was a cake, if REST was a cake, it's really just adding um, a lot of fondant around it and making it look as beautiful as possible. And obviously, everyone understands it. Um, and the key concepts for REST, they don't change because re it's resource-oriented, stateless, catchable, uniform in interface. But all of that does not go away with um, OpenAPI. But I just thought it was really important to sort of call this out. And one thing I'd like to say here is that REST APIs, if you think about it as maybe like a recipe to make a meal, right? Think about Open API as the cookbook, right? So it's like REST API can make one meal, but then Open API can make multiple meals because it has a full cookbook. You see what I'm saying? So pretty much like um, I thought that was important that I called her out. Whilst we go back to the topic on hand, which is the three, REST, GraphQL, gRPC. Now, having established that about REST, I want to speak about GraphQL and gRPC. Now, with GraphQL, some of the key concepts are it has a single endpoint, so it typically operates through a single endpoint, unlike REST, which has multiple endpoints for different resources. It, is client, it has client-specific queries, so clients define the structure of the request, specifying what fields they want from that API. There, it has a strongly typed schema. So GraphQL APIs are defined by a schema which describes the types and the relationships of the data. It also has a real-time with subscriptions. GraphQL simply supports real-time data updates through something they call subscriptions. And pretty much like with these key concepts, it sort of illuminates to you that GraphQL simply was built for 
a certain purpose, right? And so you start to extract the difference between GraphQL and REST. They have their core strengths, they have their core weaknesses, but as technology enthusiasts, you must be able to distill what works for the problem you're trying to solve. What is the problem I'm trying to solve and which one of these APIs help me execute at each different point in time? It's really not about knowing everything, it's about knowing what to use at each different point in time. Finally, with gRPC, in terms of key concepts, one is protobuf, right? So it uses protobuf, and protobuf is simply a binary data format that is simply more efficient than JSON or XML for data exchange. It also uses R RPC-based communication. This RPC-based communication allows the client to directly invoke methods on a remote server as if they were local calls. Streaming support, uh, like I did say earlier on, it's basically used in the case of YouTube and some of their channels. So gRPC supports both client-side and server-side streaming, as well as bidirectional streaming. Another point here is multiplexing with HTTP2. Right, um, gRPC uses HTTP2, which provides features like multiplexing, flow control, and more efficient data transfer. Um, as we move forward in this in this lesson, some of the core strengths of each of these are simple. With REST, it is simple. I would say it's a, a simplicity. It's easy to understand and implement using standard HTTP methods. Catching, REST can leverage catching mechanisms. It is stateless, right? It simplifies the server, right? It's widespread adoption. A lot of developers, a lot of people know about REST. So it has broad development and extensive tools, libraries, community support in their view. Another strength that GraphQL has over REST is the concept of overfetching and underfetching. Now, when clients request, request exactly what they need, or when clients want to request exactly what they need, no more or no less, they use GraphQL. However, with REST, because of the many endpoints, it can be it can either overfetch or it underfetches the information that is needed. So GraphQL is more efficient for complex queries like fetching data from across multiple resources in a single request. Another strength it has is its schema introspection, where Clients can query the API to discover its schema and capabilities, making it easier to work with these APIs. And it simply has a single endpoint, right? So it simplifies API structure by consolidating queries into one single endpoint. Well, it kind of takes it up a notch higher with gRPC. And in most of gRPC's use cases are not the familiar use cases that we use to build um, the simple systems that we build on a day-to-day. -day. Um, and so gRPC is for high performance. That's one of the strengths. Uh, one of the key strengths is high performance. Um, binary serialization, right, is, is more efficient in terms of speed and payload size than JSON over HTTP. It's used for streaming, mostly. It, um, um, it supports real-time communication through streams making it ideal for live data fields and bi-directional communication. It has strongly typed contracts and it's efficient with in microservices. Some of the challenges that involve these three, and I'll just name them really quickly, are one, for REST, overfetching, underfetching, fixed data structure, and limited in complex relationships, right? GraphQL also has its challenges, its complexity in implementation, catching challenges, performance concerns, overhead on simple APIs. gRPC also has its challenges. It's, um, it's not really browser compatible to most of what you have on the browser today. So it's not compatible. It has a steeper learning curve, which is why it's not that popular. Um, the debugging is actually not as easy because it doesn't use JSON 
and it uses something called protoboft, right? Which you need to learn how to use protoboft in order for you to debug that. And the overhead for simple APIs is, it's, it's almost an overkill, really, um, where REST APIs would, or GraphQL would really suffice. Now, it's important for me to drive all of this home by using use cases to sort of close this out. One, REST. The best place to use REST APIs is in simple CRUD operations. That is your create, read, update, delete operations. When you want, when you need to standardize for, when you need standardization for public APIs, it's important. REST is your REST is your friend. Applications with well-defined resources and op operations, REST is also your friend. In GraphQL, common use cases include mobile applications where you are minimizing data usage. is It is crucial, um, and clients can request just needed data. So the information that you just need, you can pull that out without having to over, without getting too much information. Um, applications with complex data relationships or nested data fetching, GraphQL is always good there. Scenarios where clients frequently require different views or formats of data, GraphQL is quite, quite honestly very great there. Now with gRPC, <laughs> gRPC is very great when it comes to high performance applications such as internet of things, gaming, streaming, like your Netflix, your YouTube, Amazon Prime, all of those. You have your real-time applications requiring streaming data, gRPC is great. Microservice-based architecture requiring low latency communication, GRP is, is fantastic with those. And internal APIs where efficiency is more important than public API compatibility, GRPC is also great there. Now, in order for me to sort of conclude on this REST, GraphQL, and GRPC, the major question is you need to understand what your problem is what the best use case scenario is to solve your problem and work with your development team to actually solve those problems. So the question is, what is the problem I'm trying to solve? The second point is, what are the use cases for these problems? And then you can simply plug in which API or which API specification type best fits your needs. And so pretty much that's it.